where is the best place to fish if he wants to chase a muskie in Kentucky in the 50 inch plus range. This week on Kentucky Afield. We went live on social media to answer all of your spring fishing questions, and we're bringing you those answers right now. It's all next on Kentucky Afield. Kentucky Afield. Every week, Kentucky Afield brings you features on hunting and fishing across the state. That's my pup. I'm proud of him. Here he comes right there. Let's get ready. Get ready. Look at that. What a nice, nice fish. Hey, we wow. dug it up right there. We did. There he is. Ooh, a nice one too. Boy, he's healthy. What do we got? <laughs> <laughs> that was awesome. Got the first help. Got one. Big small mouth. Very nice. Double point. They're in there. There they go. Oh my gosh. Woo! Look at that joker. Look at that. Oh, beautiful. Whoa, this is a good one. That's better than good, Chad. Hello and welcome to Kentucky Field. Tonight we're coming to you live from the Salado Wildlife Education Center and this is one of my favorite shows of the year. We're here to talk all about fishing. and We have a panel of experts here to answer all of our questions. First up I have Jeff Crosby who is our Central District Fisheries Biologist. How you doing Jeff? Doing well, thank you. Right beside him we have Jeff Ross. Uh, you've been here several times doing this with us. The Assistant Director of Fisheries. How you doing? Great. And answering all of our law enforcement questions we have Sergeant Rufus Cravens, Conservation Officer right here in Frankfurt. How you doing, Rufus? Doing well, Chad. Thanks for having me. First up, we're going to get right to our questions. We have Reed Hennessy wants to know if the smallmouth bass population on Floyd's Fork is being monitored and wants to know if the land development in, around the watershed could be hurting you. Uh, yes, we are uh, sampling smallmouth and, and rock bass on the, uh, on the Floyd's Fork. We try to do that on an every other year basis, uh, but sometimes the weather uh, plays a part in that, whether we get it done or not, but it's usually done by the district, and we also have a stream uh, research branch that mm -hmm. uh, may also do it for us uh, on various times when we can't get out there, so. But uh, yeah, we, we do have concerns about, you know, impacts to any streams, and, and definitely development can lead to impacts through siltation, you know, on our fisheries. Floyd's Fork is, a, is an interesting stream, and the fact that m much of that is really, the access has been opened up a lot. Uh, yeah, wow. it's it's great because now we've got about 20 miles uh, with the parklands of the Floyd's Fort. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of access in that within that watershed, and uh, uh, whether it be you know boating by kayaking or canoeing, uh, also with all the trails, you can walk in and mm -hmm. fish a lot of areas. So does that that additional pressure being put on it? Does that uh, does that affect the fishery very much, or the way the limits are set? Does it? I think we're fine with the limits the way they're set, and it probably gets a little bit more uh, um, pressure these days. But you know, we, we're trying to monitor it. You know, we are doing a little bit of uh, trout stockings uh, okay. during the winter months uh, yeah. to open up a, a little bit more fishery opportunities in that area. Yeah. Floyd's Fork is uh, near and dear to my heart. I was raised <laughs> right on it, walking distance as a child. So. Next question, uh, Adam Kaprowski, uh, what is the, where is the best place to fish if he wants to chase a muskie in Kentucky in the 50 inch plus range? 50. Well, reservoir wise, it'd probably be Cave Run. That seems to be the lake that produces the biggest. Mm -hmm. um, but we have seen some big fish come out of the Kentucky River as well, which some people may not be aware of, but that's another potential spot to catch a big muskie. If you were going to fish for muskie and you wanted to go target a 50 inch fish, what month would you target? I would probably look at be looking at Oct or August, uh, September time frame. Okay. Um, probably on the river. Okay. And, uh, but I think you could do that again in the fall up at, on Cave Run also okay. when they move back in those creeks. We have other bodies of water that are also uh, that cave, you know, cave runs. What everybody talks about. Right. Green River also has a good muskie population. Buckhorn. Buckhorn. Dewey is a newer one, and that's actually a good time to mention that the size limit now is going to be 40 inches across Green, Buckhorn, Dewey, and Cave Run. Okay. So they'll all be the same. Okay. Hey, and Dewey, now that 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 stocking has been going on for several years now, and and I noticed last year there was some larger fish than what had been previously shocked up there. We, we're, getting, we're seeing some bigger fish, right? Yeah, that's, they keep continuing to grow and people are catching them. With a 40 inch limit, they may be probably just below that right now, but mm -hmm. that's a good way to protect them and 
get them up to that bigger size. So. Yeah, that's fantastic. Um, next question from Paul Richardson. Wants to know if, if it's legal to use crappie as either live bait or cut bait for catfishing. No, it is not. Uh, you can't use any sport fish for bait other than red ear sunfish less than six inches. Okay, so pretty much if there's a limit on them on length or, or, or krill numbers, then it's probably a good idea to not be using that. Right, for, that's correct. So, all right, all right. Next question is from Rodney Holt. Uh, can you share krill limits at fins legs? So tell me what a sharing a krill limit is so, for people who don't know. So that would be like, for instance, at a fins lake, uh, I believe it's five trout, if you were out there trout fishing. Um, Sharing a limit would be you and I are fishing together, so we would be allowed 10. That would be like you catching seven, me catching three. Okay. You, you cannot do that. Once you hit your krill limit, you can continue to fish, uh, but you just have to release yours. You can't, you can't help someone else catch their limit as well. Gotcha. Penny Hurst, uh, question, have you stocked blue catfish in Harrington Lake? And if not, are there any plans? Uh, no, we have not stocked uh, blue cuts into Harrington, and currently we, we don't have any plans right now. Right now, it's got a, uh, a good population of channels and flatheads in the lake, mm -hmm. and uh, we are stocking hybrids into that lake right now. Uh, it's a pretty good fishery right now. Mm -hmm. So, blue catfish, uh, what is what? What's the criteria for stocking them in a lake? Uh, you know, we want to definitely have a lake with shad in them, mm -hmm. and. Uh, the other problem that I think that we have a little bit of is that, you know, a lot of these fish come out of our hatcheries and we, uh, we only have so many fish that we can put out into lakes and we've already got lakes that are set up to receive. So expanding that can be a little difficult. That means we got to give up something else mm -hmm. on another, you know, in another lake. Well, I know that, that the blue catfish have done very well at Taylorsville Lake, but that, that, that lake really had a shad overpopulation issue so. and the blue catfish was a was a was a great way to try to help control that right yes next question is from James Milby besides a life jacket what is required on a kayak uh, and what do you need to know before or after sunset or sunrise so I guess they want to know what's required on a kayak other than a life jacket and then also if you're fishing after dark gotcha so pretty much the the life jacket uh, the only other thing would be if you're going to have any type of uh, like if you were going to fish at night with a lantern or something like that then if you have any type of uh, combustible petroleum based like um, propane uh, comb and fuel anything like that then you would need a fire extinguisher on board as well okay. if you had that and then as far as the requirements for lights at night um, on manually propelled vessels such as kayaks and canoes uh, you have to have a white light that you can turn on to avoid. It doesn't have to stay on all the time, but you have to be able to turn it on in time to illuminate the vessel and the occupants to avoid, uh, you know, avoid a collision to let others know where you're at. Well, no, on a boat, you obviously got your nav lights and then you have your, what they call an anchor light. Right. So on a kayak, would a flashlight, would that account for that? If you yeah. just had a flashlight? Yes, that it would. would. White, white light, even though it's not a part of the boat, that would also work? Right, correct. Okay. All right. Yeah. Well, there you go. That's what that's what's required on a life or on a, a kayak. Uh, how often is Lake Kimmen stocked, and what species are stocked, and when? Lake Kimmen. Now, Lake Kimmen. For those that don't know, tell us where Lake Lake Kimmen is. Uh, Lake Kimmen is in uh, Henry County. It's part of the Kentucky River WMA. Uh, along with Kimmen, you've got three other water bodies up there. They're a little bit smaller, but uh, Kimmen being the the bigger one, 88 acre lake, uh, named after one of our past direct fishery directors slash deputy commissioners. Um, but uh, currently we're not doing a lot of stocking there right now. Okay. Uh, we, we normally do catfish stockings, but right now we're doing a catfish study. We've actually installed uh, some, uh, uh, we'll say some cavities or some boxes basically, spawning boxes, in order to try to uh, see if we can get those fish to, the catfish in that lake to spawn and uh, and if we can do that, then we may not have to stock as often. We can let nature kind of run its okay. course. And, and, uh, but right now, we're not doing a whole lot of stocking. The bass reproduction is great. Bluegill reproduction is great. Nature's taking care of a lot of the uh, um, you know, numbers of fish, reproductions of fish in that lake right now. Okay. Now, that, that lake is not that far from the river. Does that lake ever, ever get flooded with river water? Yes, it did. Uh, actually, last year, it, uh, during one of the floods, uh, it got about, I'd say, five, five, six feet over the dam. Oh, wow. So, okay. 
you know, we got a lot of uh, rough fish back into the lake. We've been <laughs> trying to get out. So, yeah. Um, yeah, sometimes the river stocks it for us. Yeah. We'll say. <laughs> or destocks it. Yeah, however or, you yeah, we'll have a few move in, a few move out. So. <laughs> well, that's one of those things. It's you can't. It's where it's where it's at. It's where it's at. We actually acquired that whole track where the lake came with it there, and uh, it's where it's at. I remember fishing there can be really good at times, but. Yes. Uh, with Beautiful the river hitting it, it, it uh, might take a little bit of uh, us researching it to figure out exactly when the best, what best fish to target at that water watershed. But uh, yeah, crappie, bass, bluegill are are good. So okay. It's a pretty really nice fishery. All right. Next question is from uh, George Andrew Feige. Uh, are red ear sunfish and hybrid bluegill stocked in any of the fins lakes? So we used to stock both of those. Mm -hmm. um, we did recently stock red ear, and we're kind of waiting to see they're growing really well, and some of the fins lakes are getting some really big red ear. But we put a good number in, and now we're just letting them, we don't want to overpopulate it, but okay. letting those go. We've, we have done hybrid bluegill in the past, but right now um, we're not. Okay, okay. I'll tell you what, everybody wants to know how to catch and where to catch a red ear. Uh, I yep. get more questions in the summertime when, when the bluegill spawn starts, so where can I go and catch red ear? Um, that's everybody wants to catch those that and uh, and 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 sauger or saw guy. Everybody wants to catch those two species. I think it may have something to do with table fare. <laughs> they all know they're pretty good. Uh, pretty good on the table. Next question is from uh, Amanda McDowell. What's the best uh, time um, of spring to fish for stripers on Lake Cumberland? Is it at night? And what's the best bait to use? So, when you want to go catch stripers on Lake Cumberland? Generally, I'd say that would be uh, late April into May, because usually they're coming up at night to feed on the spawning shad in the lake. Okay. And so that's generally in that time frame. It could be as late as June, possibly. I think we've caught them from April to June. Um, we've always used the top water is always the fun, uh, oh, yeah. using a thunder stick or a red fin uh, on the surfaces, you know, that's, there's a lot of adrenaline that goes with that in the middle of the night with a large fish blowing up on it. Um, slivers has also been a very good bait. Anything like that that's gonna imitate one of those shad that are up, but uh, top water's really good. That's a partic particular fishery and style of fish that I, I, when I was in the office every day, I always knew when the fish was pretty good because when you pull in, there'd be a couple of boats here. <laughs> and there'd be people going after work to head down to, to Cumberland. And, and people and, uh, falling asleep in their office the next day <laughs> when that <laughs> come in. So that, uh, you know, that's, that's all, you're right on there with that time frame. It was April and uh, time frame, right? The new yeah. moon's pretty critical. The darker, the better. Yeah. Yes. And people, it's, it's really interesting that, that that you would think that it went a really, really dark night that, um, it, that it wouldn't make a difference. But I know that a lot of people that do have some success, not on a full moon, but on not necessarily a new moon, there is a shadow uh, on yep. a bank, even when it's dark. Mm -hmm. And uh, the moon will have, some banks will be darker than others. Mm -hmm. I tell you what, when you're nighttime fishing, fish the darkest bank you mm -hmm. can find. It seems to be the most productive. Yes. Very bizarre, but uh, yep. it just seems to be how it works out. Um, next question uh, is from Carly Smith. On trolling motor only lakes, are outboard motors allowed as long as they're not turned on? And do they need to be completely trimmed up out of the water? I guess it would depend on if it's, you know, an owned or managed lake, if it's something posted by us, or if it's like a lake or, or um, you know, large pond that's owned by like a, a city or something like that that we don't own or manage. Um, like for instance, the one in um, Madison County, Owsley Fork. That is actually owned by the city of Berea. They don't allow any gas motors on there whatsoever. Okay. Uh, but I believe most of the ones that we, that Fish and Wildlife owns or manages, um, I believe you can have the gasoline motor on there. You just can't use it. It's, can't use it. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think there's anything in reg that says you can't have them on there. Yeah. Okay. But again, just, they just need to double check the wa the the you know the water that they're fishing and who actually owns that that water, whether it's us and managed by it. And uh, most of them will say, you know, no gasoline motors allowed. Okay. Um, okay. So. All right. Next question is from Lane uh, Piet. Um, it looks like can Kentucky college students who live out of state purchase a Kentucky residence license if they already possess a resident license in their home state? As long as they've been enrolled as a full-time student in an educational facility here for, I believe it's six months, then they would qualify to be able to purchase a, a resident license here as well. 
So they're asking about whether they can buy a resident license. Um, so they, they, if they've already bought a license in their state, say an Indiana kid who owns, uh, has a resident license mm -hmm. in Indiana, as long as they've been in Kentucky for six months, they can also have a Kentucky residence the same as, year? As, as a student, as long as they've been enrolled in a, as full-time student in an educational facility okay. for six months, then they can purchase one here. There you go. So. I, I did not know that. that that's yeah. interesting. All right, uh, Brian Baker, um, is the lower lake level at Rough River Lake going to interrupt the crappie spawn? So tell us a little bit what, what's going on at Rough River right now. So they're doing some work on the dam, and it's actually going to be extended period of time. I can't remember. I heard at one time maybe eight years or yeah. something like that. Um, reminisce of uh, uh, reminisce of uh, <laughs> yeah, like what Cumberland. happened at Lake Cumberland. Yes. Yeah. Um, I obviously it's going to put the crappie in an area where it's probably less structure, depending on where the water ends up. They'll still spawn, but you know it may not be what they're really looking for mm -hmm. but the fish will find a place to spawn wherever it's at if it stays stable that's the, probably the biggest thing mm -hmm. is not having it going up and down while they're spawning because they, they can find a location for sure i know there's, there's been a lot of talk about that a lot of talk about what's going on at rough river and this has happened at several other lakes like most recently uh, lake cumberland but mm -hmm. it, it seems like we've had some other lakes that have been shorter periods of time maybe one summer or um, but Rough River, we don't know the exact length of time, but you've heard you've heard potentially eight years. I heard that at one time. I don't yeah, don't yeah. quote me on that, but yeah, okay. um, I don't think anything has been set in stone. There's I think there's still a lot of questions. Yeah. You know exactly what's going to happen, but it sounds like something will happen. There, there is one benefit to come out of it is that all those areas that have been dewatered are going to grow up and terrestrial vegetation and then the water's going to come back up into it and yeah I, that'll we, help things out down the road obviously you know not right now but we we, we have obviously we saw that in some of the other lakes but mm -hmm. lake cumberland what incredible spawns do we have the years after the lake level right. got back up because i mean those sycamore trees and those trees and bushes and things around they grow pretty fast you give them four five six eight years right. and you've got a ton of spawning habitat yeah so uh hopefully they, they see a little bit of that, but uh, you have to check with the Army Corps of Engineers yep. on how long that's going to be down because that's actually uh, one of their projects, right? right. Uh, next question. Um, is there any chance that Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife would consider stocking Florida strain or F1 largemouth bass anywhere in Kentucky waters? This question is from uh, Bobby Mahan. I get this question a lot. So yes. um, F1s are Florida strain bass. People are wanting to know if, if we're considering stocking those in Kentucky water. Yeah, so the Florida bass is a separate species from the largemouth, and it's native to like peninsula of Florida and up the coastal drainage, I guess, Georgia, North Carolina, South Carolina. Down south, it has some performance benefits. It grows faster uh, than like a northern but as you move north, the, the pure strain Florida, and the F1 is, is a cross between a pure strain Florida and a pure strain uh, Northern. Okay. Um, and that's what we have native to Kentucky is pure strain Northern. Um, as you go north and it gets colder, rougher winters and less growing season, um, they tend to n not have those benefits. They grow slower they have higher mortality rates and their reproduction is less. The problem is, is they hybridize with the northern. So if you bring those fish up, put them in our waters, they're gonna cross with our northerns and all of a sudden you're just mixing in inferior genes and it's irreversible. So you can't go backwards once that happens. So it's a word, we've done some genetic tests in the past and found a very low percentage of Florida genes, you know, five, 10%. And that's still 90% northern, so that's still considered a northern population. Um, we're retesting like 25 reservoirs across the state to see where they're at now. If we all of a sudden find that it's 50% Florida genes, then that's pointing towards illegal stocking, so we're hoping we don't see that. Um, it's illegal to stock them now in the public waters, so um, we just ask that people don't do that. Uh, and speaking of illegal, there, there's another species that actually we're equally, if not even more worried about, is the Alabama bass, which is also a separate species from down south. And those grow better down there, but they are 
moving this way with people moving them and they don't do as well up here and the big thing is they outcompete largemouth so you lose your largemouth bass population they hybridize with smallmouth and spotted bass so your great fishing trips you talk about to dale hollow if they end up in there you won't be able to fish for smallmouth what smallmouth bass it'll be a smaller hybrid and wow. it can happen in like 10 years lake norman in north carolina pretty much its entire largemouth bass population taken over by Alabama bass and some of the premier smallmouth lakes in Georgia have all hybridized. So another one would do not move those. It's not going to be a good thing. And how, and how would a person, if, they, if, if their intentions are, are really good, but they may have right. very bad unintended consequences, right. a person that fishes just passively or might may even be a you know, tournament level fisherman, right. how would they be able to tell the difference between an F1 and an Alabama bass? Um, in, a, well, in a one pound or a two pound range, how, how would they so, Usually when you're doing the identification, it'll be a difference between like an F1 and a, and a northern strain largemouth. Mm -hmm. And you really, you can't tell. You, you have to genetically genetic. test yeah. them. Yeah. Um, Alabama bass and our Kentucky spotted bass are very similar as well. There's a few little differences, but most okay. people aren't going to catch it. So really that's a genetic test as well. So I don't take up the whole show talking about this. We do have our black bass management team has come put together frequently asked questions on Florida F1s and then also on Alabama bass and they're really detailed. They have answers and the scientific basis for why how our answers came about and they those should be up on our website fairly soon. They're finishing it up but anglers will be able to read every little bit of information that okay. they'd want to read about that. I those. know, it's, it's a really con confusing topic because we do have some agencies just to the south of well, us yeah. that are stocking yep. F1s yep. in waters that we share. Yeah. So there's some confusion stuff, but I think that the, the department's research on, on this topic, the fact that it's all going to be made available yeah. for every fisherman to look at, because everybody wants to catch a big fish, yeah. right? So I think that's really good. That'll be located on our website. Right. Uh, what, what, where are they going to put that on the website? Uh, we haven't decided yet, but I think we'll probably have news, a news release or something letting people okay. know they're out there. Um, one thing I failed to mention, you know, we talk about F1s and pure, pure Florida strain. You can have F2s, F3s where they start crossing back and with each other, and those get worse and worse. So um, just it's, it's not good, and yeah. um, hopefully when we get those FAQs out, a lot of those questions can get can get answered they can still anglers can call and we can still help them out with any questions they have yeah but at this point in time if you're really interested in this make sure you read the information the study that's going on and and please don't don't accidentally bring in yeah uh, not accidentally or bring in with with some good consequences right. thinking you're going to have it it's and, a it's a risk reward thing and the risk far away because you can't go backwards once they start yeah. mixing yeah so it's so kind of like the alabama bass you once they're in there you're in trouble. So this Lake Norman issue that's going on where they're getting very small bass that are not growing, I right. mean, what, what's the answer? A complete kill off and a restart? What do you do? I'm not sure anybody's come up with what got they're going to do about it. Wow. We do not want that. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Next question um, is from Jake Hall. Does a John boat need to be tagged if you are not using any form of a motor, including a trolling motor? Good question. So if you use a like a John boat, paddle boat, kayak, canoe, um, as long as you're using manual propulsion such as uh, you know oars or paddles and not using any type of uh, gasoline or electric motor, then you can use that on public waterways and it does not have to be registered. Okay, there you go. And uh, the foot pedal drive is it's considered pure manual as well. No, right, no, that's correct. Okay. All right, I know they're getting really popular right now. Now you can use. Uh, on private waters, you can use a John boat or a small boat like that with an electric motor on it on private waters, and it does not have to be registered. But if you put that with that electric motor on it, if you put it on a public waterway, it does have to be registered. Okay, there you go. Next question is from Tristan Brooks. Uh, how do I enter a fish into the Master Ang Angler Program in Kentucky? I know we've had some questions about the Master, master yeah. Angler Program. And is that, that still going on? Well, that's that's partly on us, and, and we've made it where this is a very high priority. It's gonna require, our system and databases are gonna require some IT programming that us fisheries people have no idea about. <laughs> okay. And so we just need to make it happen. Right now, you, you can't, you can enter in for like the trophy 
category, but the master angler where you catch three trophies, yeah. you, it's not working. Okay. So okay. that's where people, they, they probably have caught three trophies and want to get the master angler and you can't do it right now. So okay. we promise we're, that's high priority this year. All right, we're gonna, so we're gonna get that up and running. Yep. Technology and fishing, man. I tell you what, you're talking about a hot topic. There's all kinds of questions that, that evolve around technology being used in fishing right now. But I tell you what, there is a, there is a piece of technology that is going to be available. It, it may be available now, or if not, it's going to be really soon, and it's being offered by the Kentucky Fish and Wildlife Foundation. And I know that uh, they've developed a fishing app. Mm -hmm. It's going to be utilized here in the state of Kentucky that really compiles all the real useful information that you may need to know about where to fish and what's the best way to fish there, including all the data that you guys put together as a biologist on the fishing forecast all in one location, right? And that's the, what, what's the new, the new app called? It's Fish Boat KY. Fish Boat KY. So it's, it's available on Apple and Google, mm -hmm. right? If you go pick this up, it, it, uh, it's operated and owned by the Kentucky Fish and Wildlife Foundation, but if you download this app, it's got all the information you guys put in as far as where to fish and boat ramps and is there a fee, and you know, I think you right. can actually buy a fishing license on yep. there as well. You can actually, once you buy your license, you can download the license directly to your phone so that it shows up on the screen. So if you're outside of internet access, you still have it. Now if oh, your okay. phone goes dead, you're got a problem but yeah, yeah. Um, but it also incorporates like Google Maps in your location okay. so you can be at a restaurant and but you got your fishing pole in the car and it's like I wonder if there's anywhere to fish around here and you just click one button and it'll show you the from nearest to furthest away the distance to different places you hit them and it'll give you driving directions Wow. see the species that are in there so it's pretty cool it ties into fishing forecasts areas to yep. fish what the rules and regulations are krill and size limit everything's available right yep. there right yep. so hey if you're if you're trying to plan a fishing trip there might be a good spot to start so take your phone and download fish boat kentucky and it's the new fishing app that's going to be available a lot of great information mm -hmm. in there so you can uh, start a fishing trip right there can't you yep all right, next question is from uh, Jimmy Wilson. Can walleye survive if they're put in a farm pond? Uh, I would not recommend walleye in farm ponds. Okay. Um, over the years when we were doing farm ponds, uh, we actually checked several where they had stocked walleye. And I don't think any of the ponds we looked at, we ever found a walleye. So oh, wow. it's, it's just not the, the right uh, habitat for the walleye. So uh, it's not a fish that we would recommend. So when people ask, there's always that the two-toned answer when someone says, will this fish survive in this waterway? <laughs> Surviving is one thing and, and repopulating is completely another thing. And so uh, if you did put a fish in there and it, it, it's not going to hit the water and belly up and be dead in seconds, it might swim away, but it's probably not going to make it and then it's definitely not going to reproduce, right? Correct. Yeah. It, again, you may live for a period of time, like you say, and then, you know, it's just not the good, the conditions and the, it's those real stressful conditions or that, you know, that those certain conditions they need uh, it, during a period of time, you know, of the year may not be available and, you know, either they die or they starve to death. Yeah. Because you know, yeah. the food's not there. Yeah. All right. So not a good idea to put a walleye in a pond. No. Like I said, everybody wants to know how to catch these really tasty fish. Walleye well, is yeah. on the list. That is very much on the list. <laughs> Next question, Daryl Stone uh, wants to know, when should I start fishing for white bass in the headwaters of Dix River? Soon. <laughs> I would say uh, I'd be watching water temperatures. I think we're still in the 40s right now. Yeah. Uh, as we started hitting those, the 50s, when to start watching, generally it's going to be mid-50s, which is going to be Aprilish. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's, this goes for Taylorsville, Dix River, you know, open the salt. And, uh, but uh, about April, water temperatures hit 55, the males move up. As you get into the upper 50s, 60s, the females move up. So that's the time frame uh, that you're looking for. It's probably mid-April is going to be the time. White bass are one of those species that everybody, because it's one of the first really, really good fishing opportunities, especially mm -hmm. for bank fishing. We're talking about... Nolan, Dix River, um, Salt River, Salt River. But I'll tell you what, if you go there and you catch them really good your first trip, you probably were late. <laughs> and if you go there and you fish them the very, very, very first time early and you really, really catch them, you're probably too early. Mm -hmm. It takes a little bit of time. You're not going to probably do it in one trip, are you? 
Unless you got a buddy that's a really good friend that goes, hey, today, let's go. I caught them there yesterday. It, uh, I usually make a couple of trips to try to find white bass. And not every trip is great, but if you go enough, you're going to have some really good trips. And then you got to fight around all these weather systems that seem to come in every four days. So. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that's the problem. It's great. And all of a sudden, the water changes a little yes. bit. But I tell you what, though, hard fighting fish, they're a lot of fun to catch. And when you're on them, it's one ride right for the next. Isn't mm -hmm. it? White bass fishing, I'll tell you what, that's, that's one of the things that gets you excited about spring it's right there. a great way to start the spring. Oh, it is, absolutely. Next question is from Ronnie Brock. What has changed to allow the dams on the Elkhorn and Green River that were once needed to be, uh, to be removed? So uh, we've done some dam removals. Um, some dam removals have been done through private entities. I know mm -hmm. that Elkhorn Creek, that was actually done by Jim Beam Distilleries, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, what has changed to allow them to remove these dams? I don't know if anything's changed. I think a lot of them have just, you know, are older and older. They po potentially pose a, a hazard, but also, you know, there's, there's a big push to get rivers and streams back to their historical flow and, and things like that. So, you know, a lot of them, if they're not being used for what they were designed for, and potentially pose a hazard or you know the funding's there to be able to take them out you know that's that's how they come out i know that particular dam down at, on the Elkhorn near jim beam initially they were needing a large volume of water for potential fire suppression right right and they tapped into the city water mm -hmm. had plenty of water available for fire suppression it was a hazard it wasn't being maintained and they decided to take it right. out some of the green river projects that the dams that have been taken out there uh, are, I'm not sure why they've been taken out, but I know one thing, the, the long-term navigation of those waters and the, the spawning ability for having more riparian waters, upside's there, right? Mm -hmm. And it's not dangerous, right? I think some of those were in disrepair and they didn't want to have to re, you know, rebuild them, but it's just, it, when you, those dams can serve as barriers for fish. And uh, so when you, remove those dams, you're going back into more free flowing, which is actually better for smallmouth and rock bass. Okay. Uh, you, you need that, that flowing sections. The, the, those, those areas that are impounded are probably a little bit better for your largemouth and your bluegill, but uh, when you're talking about stream fishing, you know, removing those dams is, is it's much better habitat, uh, having that free flowing uh, stream, having those pool riffles and you know, having a little bit more complex habitat there. Very good. Uh, let's see, Will Kayla Crawford wants to know, how's the crappie fishing out on Cave Run? It's actually um, not too bad. Uh, you know, I had talked to our biologist not too long ago about that, and um, he said earlier in the spring, you want to go up lake, and then you, as the year progresses, you come back down lake, and we got a lot of habitat that we put in there. Um, the one thing he did say is, that there's a lot of fish like eight nine inch mm -hmm. that are still legal to keep but a lot of people are just you know throwing them back because they're going for the big one so there's a big block of those fish and actually if people would keep some of those it may speed up the growth on the rest of them and get them a little bit bigger so there's there's fish in there maybe the bigger fish is down just a little bit because there's a big pod of eight to nine or nine inches so i fished cave run for crappie last week and we did really well. Good. Um, and I'll tell you, we caught some fish up to 15 inches. So we caught some really, really good fish. Now, we did see and catch some smaller fish, and the guy that I was fishing with was saying, hey, if you want to take home, you know, 10 of these, 15 of these for the skillet, and he, we were catching some 8, 9, 10-inch fish. Mm -hmm. He was like, these are perfect for that. Yeah. And But we were catching good That's numbers good of fish up to 15 inches. So... Uh, um, I have some first-hand experience on this question. <laughs> I'd like some more first-hand experience. <laughs> that, was a, that was a good day on the water. We went out, and I don't think we've even aired it yet, so that, uh, be looking for that. If you're interested in fishing Cave Run for crappie, we got something coming for you real soon. Next question uh, is from Gabe Stalkup. Wants to know, what's the best method for catching largemouth bass in the 40 to 50 degree water temperature range? There you go. What's your best technique for catching them in cold water? Jerk bait. You like a jerk bait? I like the jerk bait. Yeah. It's it's just by preference. That's jerk bait works great. Works great in spring and it works great in the in the fall. Mm -hmm. um, that's a really good really good bait to, to throw in that because 
in jerk bait, you know, you're throwing it out there and you're bringing it down and you're allowing it to suspend and sit there. And I think that's the number one thing of fishing cold water. Don't move your lure too fast. Right. And you're letting it sit there. And sometimes it's four, five, ten seconds pauses. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you like a jerk bait. I like the jerk bait. What about I you? Think, I think once you start getting towards 50 degrees, you can probably Work it get up a faster. little more active, you know, yeah, like yeah. slow roll a spinner bait or, you know, some kind of blade bait or something, you know, a little more action to it because they're that's getting close to pre spawn, yeah. you know, where they're starting to move. Crank baits are good too. Crank baits uh, in the winter time. I tell you what, it's really whatever bait you got a lot of confidence in. Just uh, in that 40 degree water temperature, slow it down. Yeah. Really, really present the bait in a, in a slower uh, mm -hmm. way and then start speeding it up once you start getting into the 50s. A lot of people don't realize that if a bass could pick its water temperature, what do you think it would be? If a bass could say, I want the, I want the if, like me, I, I take October every day, all day in Kentucky, right. but a bass, they really have a preferred temperature range and they'll seek that out mm -hmm. regardless if it's, they can find warmer water when it's really cold, they'll do it. They'll find colder water when it's really hot. So what's that preferred temperature range? I think it's probably upper 50s, lower 60s. So, I mean, you're, once people talk about 50s, thinking, oh, that's really cold water. You're almost in a situation for a bass. You're getting right to ideal, perfect water mm -hmm. conditions and water color. So around high 50s into the lower 60s? I, I think that's, it seems to be when they, to me, that you really catch them well. Yeah, yeah. Those, that, that temperature range. So don't let the 50s scare you away. You no. may be absolutely don't ideal. The, don't let the 40s scare you. Oh, yeah. No, if people ask me when I, they know that they see me loading up and heading out, and they're like, isn't it too cold? And I go, there's no such thing. When the water gets hard, it's rough out of a boat, but uh, you can still dig a hole and uh, yeah, bore a right. hole and still catch fish. <laughs> so there's, fish are going to eat. They, they're, they're eating somewhere, so. Next question uh, from Brad Waits. Just wondering if there are smallmouth bass in Clear Creek th that goes uh, through Shelby County. He's wanting to give it a try. You know anything about Clear Creek? That uh, yes, uh, I would say it's limited numbers. I mean, that's Shelby Lake is an impoundment of Clear Creek, and of course that portion is going to be mainly largemouth and decent largemouth actually in that. Uh, but you get down below, it, you know. It goes on down toward the, the, the Salt River below Taylorsville. Uh, probably be pretty limited. There are probably a few there, but I wouldn't call it, you know, a big time smallmouth fishery. But there's probably some there. I fished it a time or two, and we have caught some smallmouth bass. Like you say, not not in big numbers, but mm -hmm. we have caught some in there. But so I know they're there. But I think I agree with yeah. you. Maybe not in big numbers. Um, Ronnie Brock uh, wants to know since the department does the stock ponds. How do they recommend people to start a pond? So if you dig a pond, what's the best way to stock it? Main two fish you want to stock in your pond is a largemouth bass and a bluegill. Uh, I would stock them at a ratio of four to one, four bluegill to one bass. So that's about 400 bluegill to 100 bass per acre. Those are the two main fish for, for the pond. The other two fish that are appropriate, and if you want to stock them, and it's really the pond owner's preference would be a uh, channel catfish and a shell cracker slash the red ear sunfish. Mm -hmm. uh, so those four fish are, are the four fish we recommend for ponds other than the grass carp. That grass carp is for biological control of uh, vegetation. Those are fine too, but we're talking on the sport fish end, largemouth, bluegill, red ear, and the uh, channel cat. I tell you what, pond fishing is something I think is very overlooked, especially uh, early in the year. You want to go out and catch a, a good fish or start catching fish early. Those waters tend to warm up a little bit faster. Mm -hmm. If you can get access to a farm pond, I don't think there's a better way to teach teach a, 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 a anyone, an adult or a kid or whatever, how to fish is to go into a farm pond. Farm pond is one of the first first places that I want to go in the in the now. This is a yeah. great time right now to start going and hitting some farm ponds. That, that water starts to barely warm. Really quick, um, on our website. If you go to the fishing and just scroll down, there's a picture, I think, and you, it's managing your farm pond. It covers every aspect of your building it, stocking it, fertilizing, fish kills, everything. Okay. We put that together because, you know, we don't get out as much to the private pond. So we provided essentially the technical guidance all in one spot. I'll tell you what, there is a host of information, maybe not the easiest to find on our website. There's so, there's more information than you'd want to know about right. wherever you want to fish, 
all the information you guys pull, I mean, you can go and look at uh, uh, shocking krill surveys and find out what, how many fish were in every inch class of di all the different species. I do think that this, this fishing app we talked about earlier might be a way to help make some of that more manageable to find out what are you really trying to find. So the information is out there. Um, you know, it's not super easy to navigate and find, but it's out there. And if you want to find it, you know, make, make, give a phone call, give us a call. You can always reach us at 1-800-858-1549. Call and give us, a, give us a call. We'll try to help you locate whatever piece of information, that, whether it be stocking your farm pond or planning your next fishing trip. Uh, there's, the information's out there, and there are now new tools that will also help you find that information. And Chad, also the uh, the department maintains, and I'm not sure if it's on the website or not, but the department maintains a list of licensed fish propagators yes. in the state. So if somebody's looking, well, where can I buy the bluegill? Where can I get the bass? The department maintains that, and it, it's a list of, of people with the contacts and what species they sell and so forth. So yeah, that, I know that a lot that's of that's on that it's site, on the and so okay. is a list of pond consultants okay. if you want to bring somebody in to okay. assist you. Yeah. Okay. I know that sometimes I hear people saying that they're local, uh, you know, what, what's the place that sells the little chicks in southern states or yeah. those, those places will have yeah. certain times where fish companies will be there mm -hmm. to drop off fish or do whatever. So they're, they're, the, 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 the opportunities, that they're available. You just got to go to the website there right. and you, you'll find out what's near you. Next question, uh, once, uh, it's from Sa uh, Sandy Sharing wants to know, what are some WMAs that have fishable lakes? So they want to go to wildlife management area that has fishable lakes. Where do you recommend? Uh, well, you got uh, the uh, Kentucky River WMA we talked about earlier uh, mm -hmm. out there with Kinman. Like I said, there's there's three other water bodies there. One's four acres, one's six, and one's 15. Okay. So that's a that's a great opportunity. Uh, I think uh, what Central WMA's got quite a few ponds on it, I believe. Peabody's Peabody. got more ponds than you probably fish in a lifetime on it. <laughs> There's, There's a lot, there are of, a lot of lakes out on yep. Peabody. Out there. And I've been out on and Peabody. They have different varieties of fish in them. And yeah. So if you wanted, if you wanted to go to Peabody WMA, which has all those lakes, is there someone down there? I mean, I know a lot of those are wildlife biologists, but there is there someone down there that can kind of help them decide what lake to go to based on what fish species they want to right. target? Yeah, they can call our south or south our Northwestern Fisheries District. Okay. Um, if you look in our fishing and boating guide, there's a page towards the back that has all our districts and their phone numbers. Give them a call, they can point you to the right place. That's probably the best way to do it. There is a permit that you have to get for Peabody, so just keep that in mind. Okay, I think it's uh, like $15, $15 yeah. permit. You know, you, you mentioned the boating and fishing guide. The boating and fishing guide is something that People look forward to it coming out, and it's we're getting close. Mm -hmm. It's about ready to be released. So the boating and fishing guide is about ready to be out there. So check your local retailer or go online. You can download that. And I think, again, the Fish app mm -hmm. is trying to provide more and more opportunities for people to get that wherever they're at. And being able to download that and have it on your phone mm -hmm. would be nice. But it's about ready. The printed copies are really, really close. We're looking at a couple weeks, and they're going to be out there and available at your local retailers. If you're one of those people that want to have that hard copy, they're, they're on their way, so you'll be getting those soon. Next question uh, is from Pam Brooks. She wants to know what the difference is between a daily limit and a possession limit. This is a question that we get asked a lot, and uh, it sounds like the same thing, but it's actually not, is it not? Right. So a daily limit is basically what you're allowed in one calendar day. A possession limit is what you're allowed to keep after two days, two or more days of fishing, and does not include processed fish. Okay. So what... Uh, Tell me a reason why there'd be a difference between a possession limit and a daily limit. Well, I mean, maybe somebody goes on a camping trip. Mm -hmm. uh, they're going to fish one day and then stay the night and fish the next day. Mm -hmm. uh, so that would be one reason why you would have the possession limit. Uh, maybe they didn't have a chance to clean them, you know, the night before fishing. Especially uh, in the spring when you're crop fishing and the water temperature in your live well or water te temperature is really, really cool. Those fish will live and you don't want to make two messes. So you. You can actually fillet two days worth of fish at one time, right? right. That's kind of the reason for that. That makes sense. All right, uh, next question is from uh, Thomas Wattrell. Uh, do rainbow trout uh, hold over any of the lakes, and how about Spli High Splint Lake? Boy, High Splint Lake got all the attention, what, two years ago? And uh, tell us a little bit about, do rainbow trout, even if it's deep enough and has cool enough water, mm -hmm. can, they, can they survive that year? Yeah, they can. Um, okay. It takes cool 
water that has enough oxygen in it. So, you know, most of our lakes form a thermocline, which is a, you know, the, the oxygenated water is above it and then it goes away below it. So typically right at that level, it's probably not cool enough for, for the rainbow trout, but we do have lakes that are clear that they have cool oxygenated water and those fish can hold over. They probably and high some... is probably one that, that can happen because it fits that mold. Yeah, deep, real deep, probably yeah. has springs, spring fed, cool water. We in. put them in Paintsville is another one that probably, you know, could pull that off. And Greenbow Lake, you know, we, there's some that we put in that, you know, probably have a really good chance. And we've seen them, you know, you get 15 or 16 inch rainbows and we know we didn't stock them that size. Yeah. So. <laughs> All right, there you go. So you, there are some holdover, but it takes a very unique yep. body of water. Yep. Uh, next question is from Jeff Coulter. What can be done to keep farm pond from turning over due to low oxygen? The only thing you could do is it would be possibly install aeration system. Okay. Uh, but uh, that's not something that happens every year, typically for farm ponds, mm -hmm. these, these events. Um, I generally don't recommend aeration unless you're having a consistent problem with it, meaning you've had, you know, these events happen, you know, several over the last, you know, three out of the last five years or something like that. Then I, I, the aeration is when I start recommending it. Uh, a lot of those happen once every 10 years, you know, maybe once every 20 years. And uh, the cost of restocking a few fish versus maintaining or well, buying, maintaining and running that aeration system over that same period of time is a whole lot more expensive. Yeah. But it comes down to what the landowner wants. Yeah. So yeah. if that's something the landowner would want to do to, to but possibly alleviate you know, that happening and uh, aeration works, uh, but uh, again, if you don't want to spend the money and you deal with that issue maybe once in a blue moon, then you, know, you can do that also. Okay, all right. We're getting a ton of questions. I appreciate everyone for submitting their question. We're gonna to try to get to a couple more here pretty quick. Uh, Raymond Onan, are the, uh, are the jellyfish in Kentucky a good uh, source for other fish? So are they being eaten by other fish? Uh, no, uh, fish tend to avoid them. Uh, oh, really? However, uh, crayfish or uh, turtles will eat the, the freshwater jellyfish uh, that we have here. These jellyfish are harmless. That's a question we get a lot when yeah. people see them and they kind of freak out. But we do have freshwater jellyfish in the state, and uh, they're actually a life form of a certain, uh, it's a hydrozoan, it's part of their life cycle. Not in the other part, they're actually on the bottom as a, a little not moving uh, organism that colonize the bottom you know, on a hard substrate or something like that. Um, but interestingly enough, uh, they were actually, one. Of, they're not indigenous here, they're actually out of the Yangtze River in China. And uh, so they're introduced here and they, they were actually found back in 1916 here in Benson Creek. Oh, really? uh, it was one of the one of the first observations of them. Wow! So, kind of so interesting. we've been around for a while, huh? Yeah. Um, oh man, I said these are going to be quick. Randy here asked a question. We could go on for this a little bit. This is a, a question everybody wants to know: Do bass spawn by the moon phase, or is it water temperature? I think it's more on the water temperature, and I'm not going to say moon phase doesn't play in. Yeah. But I think uh, you know, photo period, photo period temperature. Stable water mm -hmm. uh, are, are definitely factors. Probably water temperature, I think, play, probably plays uh, more than anything mm -hmm. into the spawning of bass. So it's interesting. So can fish, how long will, they, how long will bass haul, haul eggs? I think a female, I mean, there's, there's some instances where we see that they don't, re, you know, they don't spawn and they'll hold them and they'll actually reabsorb them. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's that, but generally you've got about a month there where those females will move up under the right conditions and having the males that have built nests to come in and spawn. All right, we, and I, I've seen pictures of people that already caught some crappie and they've already got some eggs in them. Mm -hmm. So it's, right now fish are producing eggs and mm -hmm. holding some eggs. So some species of fish anyhow. Um, next question, Paul Edwards. Um, we have an exchange student who does have social security number with, but would like to experience fishing. What do they need I, to do? I've had the same, we hosted an exchange student, so I can know this one from experience. You just need to call up here to our um, 
uh, call up here, the 1-800-858-1549. They, they will provide some basic information, name, address, and so forth, and the department will issue that student, that, that individual, a uh, Fish and Wildlife ID number, and then they can use that to purchase a license just like you or I would our social. Very cool. You told me that was a great experience for your family hosting an exchange. It was. Yeah, we've had four, uh, four so far. It's been, been a really and, good experience. And they wanted to fish here in Kentucky while they were uh, A couple here? of them. Oh, yeah, not all of them, but a couple of them. They all wanted to go shooting. Um, <laughs> <but>. <laughs> Very interesting. Yeah. All right, next, uh, Sean Johnson. How do you get access to Elkhorn Creek? It seems like access is really hard to find. Uh, there are uh, several accesses on the Elkhorn, and uh, either you can go to our website and look at the, that or the new app, possibly, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, because there's some, uh, there's still a few of the VPA, the Voluntary Public Access so uh, sites, where they could go in and fish. Uh, there's also uh, a couple other locations where they can go in, uh, uh, like, like at the hatchery, Sullivan Lane WMA, there's, uh, again, you've got several locations that you can go in and access the creek. Um, again, you can float that, there's a lot of, lot of kayaking through there, so if you've got a kayak, you, you can go from uh, location to location. Uh, also, another thing to plug is our stream, uh, our, there's a stream section to our, our fishing page, uh, and uh, you can go to like Elkhorn Creek, and it will give you a lot of information about Elkhorn Creek. It'll give you those locations. It'll give you distances oh, cool. uh, between each of those uh, access points. Now, is that the Blue Water Trails? That's not the Blue Water Trails. Okay. There's actually part of our, our uh, fishing, we'll say out in the fishing tab, uh, it talks about stream. I can't remember exactly what it says. It's another but, one of the things at the top that has a picture associated yeah. with it. And, uh, There's so much information yeah. on there. Yeah. <laughs> but it'll, it'll give you, uh, you know, last sampling it'll give you pictures of those look of those access so you know what they look like okay and it also will give you a, a link to the the gauge for elkhorn oh, wow. okay. so and it also gives you recommendations on what the gauge is if it's good you know high medium or low you know when to go when not to go that type of stuff now all that information is that available for other streams other than elkhorn or is yes. that just elkhorn okay there's, so there, there's there a lot go. there's several streams and they're then they they just added floyd's fork onto it i okay. believe that's what they just added i tell you what knowing the flow is really really important yes so if you can go in there and find that information and you know what you're looking for when you get there uh you can while you're there look right onto the fishing forecast and find out what's forecasted for that uh, mm -hmm. that body of water Man, you, you got to leg up right there before you leave your house. Right. So, all right, here, next question, Corey Williams. Uh, what, are, what are each of us mostly, most looking forward to when it comes to fishing over the next few months? What do you think? What, what are you looking forward to? Crappie fishing yeah. coming up in April. Yeah. So. A couple of your, your uh, areas in your district are really, really good crappie fishing. Taylorsville's doing very well right now. We've got some smaller lakes that are doing pretty well too. Okay. Uh, provide some opportunities like Beaver, Elmer, uh, Kenman mm -hmm. is, is an opportunity to catch some crappie. Uh, but Taylorsville is doing real well right now. Okay, so. all right. We live on a, well, here in Frankfurt, Duckers Lake. It's a small community lake and I got a little bass buggy, so I'm oh, yeah. about ready to <laughs> drag that out and get out on that, that lake because it's, oh, yeah. it's got some good fishing. There you go. We look forward to crappie fishing. I bought a live scope system last year, and I've oh. got it rigged up as a portable and use it on my little two-man boat and pond oh, yeah. fish. Oh, wow. Got a couple, three pretty large ponds, and uh, I enjoyed it last year with that live scope. Just still trying to learn how to use it and read it, but uh, that's what I'm I'm, I'm, I'm shocked that we didn't get more questions of involving technology yeah, and live scope because right. yeah. the live scope, we've been showcasing that a lot. And man, I tell you what, uh, you, you either, there's, there's love or there's hate for, the, for those live scope. But uh, I'll tell you what, that's an interesting tool and it's a it great is. tool to locate fish. But, it amazes uh, me how many fish your bait actually goes by that the fish look at it follow it but don't take it i mean it just it it is a it's yeah, amazing tool it i'll tell you the and and what i've catch myself i don't have a live scope just yet i love fishing with one it's an interesting tool but one of the things that i um i'll catch myself as i get a little bit older is uh taking fishing back to a more simpler form mm -hmm. so uh, right now I'm, I'm looking for forward to doing some pond fishing in some local ponds that I get access to get in there and fish. And if you ask the neighbors, you can probably, and you clean up after yourself, you can probably get access as well. But pond fishing for me in the, in the, in the 
late winter, early spring is kind of where it starts. Uh, you cannot be going out and, and hitting a, a farm pond. And I tell you what, there's some really big bass that for whatever reason throughout the year that might be hard to catch, they, they present themselves and become available now. It's a really good time to start getting out there. You get those one or two warm days in a row, those ponds warm up fast. So I think that's a really good opportunity. Well, I hope everyone out there is planning their fishing trip. I, I've got a couple of weekends set aside that I can't wait to get out there and take the kids. Remember that your fishing license here in the state of Kentucky, they expire at the end of February. So good place to start is go to the website, download this new app we've been talking about, pick up a copy of the fishing guide that's coming out. It should be available anytime. Make sure you buy that fishing license and make sure you get outdoors because I tell you what, there's not many more exciting, fun things to do. And we've been uh, cooped up in the house all winter is to get out and do some fishing. So, hey, thank you guys for tuning in. If your question didn't get answered, you can always call us up, uh, reach out to one of your fisheries biologists or 1-800-858-1549. Or and remember, Hunting and fishing on private property is a privilege. Always ask permission and thank the landowner. Until next week, I'm your host, Chad Miles, and I hope to see you in the woods or on the water.